Hey up Sofa Squad and welcome back to Black Sofa. Now, don't get me wrong, I love making these videos, but sometimes working by myself can get a bit lonely. They ask you how you are and you just have to say that you're fine when you're not really fine, but you just can't get into it because they would never understand. Today, I'm not working alone. Today, I'm working with my good friend, Mr. Bad-Tempered Badger. And we'll hear what he has to say a bit later. But first, let's hear what Joe from Off The Curb Ministries has to say. Number one, and perhaps the most disturbing out of all the creatures that have ever been on this earth are the Nephilim Giants. Hey. I'm going to stop you right there, Joe, because those photos are fake. A quick Google search yields an article from Snopes.com that explains the images were assembled from various individual hoaxes that presented them with varying backstories sourcing them to recent archaeological discoveries in the Mediterranean. The article goes on. Of course, none of these supposedly remarkable archaeological discoveries has ever found its way into a museum or the pages of a scientific journal. These photos are fake, so the fact that you have used them in your video means that you were either too lazy to fact check them or you are being disingenuous at best or deliberately deceitful at worst. It says in the Bible, right at the beginning of the Bible in Genesis 6, the Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward, when the sons of God came in to the daughters of man and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. <laughs> I love the spoopy voice you use to make the Nephilim sound as sinister as possible. <laughs> Hilarious. Now I'm not going to lie to you, this is a very difficult passage in the Bible to understand. But just try and take it into your mind. Here we have these angelic beings. There's no evidence at all for these angelic beings. But please, continue. The sons of God. These are the same sons of God that we hear about in the book of Job. You know where Lucifer wants to try and attack Job and take him out? These are the same angelic beings who were with the Lord God in heaven and they fell. You see these angelic beings, they looked down and they saw that the women on earth were beautiful. So they go down to earth and they have relationships with the women and these women get pregnant and they give birth to these sort of hybrid creatures, these half man, half angel creatures. And that's where the Nephilim giants come from. The only evidence you have for these Nephilim is the Bible says so. And because these Nephilim are so big in stature, the people around make them as like leaders. They look at them and think, these are mighty men, these are wonderful. So you may be asking the question, how did the Creator respond to all of this? Well, I wasn't wondering anything of the sort, but I'm sure you're going to tell me regardless. Well, it says in the Bible, that it grieved God's heart. Don't believe the lie when people say the God of the universe, he doesn't care. He's just some distant deity sat on a cloud. He doesn't intervene. No, when we sin, it breaks God's heart. You know, and they ask you how you are, you just have to say that you're fine when you're not really fine, but you just can't get into it because they would never understand. Well, first, you have to prove to us that your God exists. But that aside, Sin is just a concept invented by the religious so that the religious can sell us an imaginary cure. How can we commit crimes against a deity that in all likeliness doesn't even exist? 
The God of the universe is a sensitive God. We are made in his image and the reason we have feelings, deep feelings of love, of compassion, is because the God of the universe gave us his feelings to feel. So he took those angelic beings and he wrapped them, he bound them into everlasting chains. He put them into a place of gloomy darkness, into the very abyss of hell and confined them there saying, no longer will you be able to leave this place. You are here for all of eternity. And then what happened to our own race, to men and women? Well, have you ever heard of the story of Noah and the ark? Well, yes, I have. But I think I'll let my friend Bad Tempered Badger take this one. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Sofa. Let's see what we got here. Eternity, and then what happened to our own race, to men and women? Well, have you ever heard of the story of Noah and the Ark? It's not so much about this cute cartoon with rhinoceroses and elephants hanging out of the window. No, Noah's Ark was no joke. Oh, Noah's Flood. I've got a whole fancy pants vid on my channel about how this is a huge pile of elephant shit. But for the sake of brevity, let's focus on one area. An African elephant eats about 150 kilograms of plant matter and drinks 50 gallons of water a day and shits out around 120 kilograms. So, throughout the flood, 371 days according to the Bible, an elephant would need 55,650 kilograms of plant matter, 18,550 gallons of water, and would produce 44,520 kilograms of shit. There's also two, so double that for a total of 89 tons of shit, 37,100 gallons of water, and 111,300 kilograms of plant bits over the whole course of the flood, from first rains to the animals leaving the ark. That's just elephants, and it's a huge undertaking, even in modern zoos with outside food suppliers and many rotating staff members. When you account for other large animals like rhinos, giraffes, hippos, buffalo and so on, you're going to need a pretty significant lake sloshing around the ark to keep them from dying of thirst and a huge stock of varying types of plant life to feed them. Then of course there are the predators. Lions, once averaged out, consume around 6 kilograms of meat a day for a total of about four and a half tons of meat between two lions over the course of the voyage. That's about 16 and a half average zebras. Clearly two of each isn't viable, and whatever animals all the predators are going to eat through the voyage would also need to be fed, adding more to the already hilariously overstocked barge. Is there room in the ark described in the Bible? In short, no. According to The Impossible Voyage of Noah's Ark, linked in description, the ark would need to carry around four million animals and, given the size as written in the Bible and accounting for internal structural supports, that leaves the ark with about 1,063,125 cubic feet of usable space. According to the Bible's numbers, Noah and the gang would be able to furnish each animal with around 0.275 cubic feet of space. That's slightly worse than my last train trip. The floods that came purged the earth of all of that perversity. God wiped out all of this sickness, all of this disgust that was such an abomination to him that it might return to be something of what he first created it to be. And the Bible tells us at the very, very end of this earth, God will again purge the earth, he'll renew it, he'll melt it, he'll make it into something beautiful so it returns to the original creation because you and I, although we haven't done some of the perverse things we're talking about now, we have sinned and we have corrupted this beautiful earth and the sensitive God who loves us all deeply wants us to be pure and holy and to worship him and for it to go back to the beginning where man and God walk together in the garden. Leaving the boat aside for a moment, and that flooding the whole planet would kill off almost all plant life, what do you think happens to all the fish? They tend to be quite specialised to their respective levels of salinization. so mixing fresh with salty water would handily kill off both sets of creatures. 
whoever wrote this narrative really didn't think it through. Or, of course, the authors were around before science, so didn't know any of the ramifications of the stories they wrote. You don't get a return to Eden from a global flood, mate. You get a muddy, soggy, messy mass extinction and millennia before things start to recover. Let's move on. But hey now, that is not the last time we hear about the Nephilim in the Bible. Am I the only one, when I was a kid at Sunday school, who used to sing this song, 12 men went to spy on Canaan? You see, when the people of Israel were freed from slavery in Egypt, they wandered in the wilderness for many, many years. But God promised them that they would have a land. They would have a nation, a place where they could build up their people and live there forever. And God led them to the people of Canaan. Andrew Brown, writing in The Guardian, says this, There is no historical figure of Moses and no reason from archaeology or history to suppose any of the Exodus story is true. Philip Davis, a British archaeologist, says Moses himself has about as much historic reality as King Arthur. And as the spies went out to see if the land was safe to take for themselves, they saw these giants. It actually says they saw Nephilim. Wait, wait, wait. Hang on a minute. I thought, didn't God send the flood in order to wipe out the Nephilim? And yet, here we're seeing the Nephilim again after the flood. So, are you saying that God's plan didn't work? And because these giants were so big compared to the spies, the men felt like they were just grasshoppers. And then it gets even more interesting because we hear about this other giant clan, these people called the Rephaim, and from them came someone called King Og. So not only was he a terrifying king, but he was also a giant. It's said about King Og that his bed was 13.5 feet long. Now that is a king-sized bed if you've ever heard of one before. Well, I've scoured the internet for information on King Og, but I can't find any concrete evidence for him outside of the Bible. Before I move on to the next creature, I know what some of you are thinking. When are you going to mention Goliath, Joe? Actually, I was thinking about what to have for dinner tonight. But go on. Well, yes, Goliath is believed that he was also a descendant from the Nephilim. And you remember the story. Here is this great Philistine, and he's terrifying all of these soldiers of Israel. They're so scared. And then that ruddy little lad, David, turns up with no armor, but just five little stones. He casts that stone into the sling, and the great giant comes tumbling down. Well, according to 1 Samuel 17.4, Goliath was six cubits and one span, which is roughly nine foot six inches. This is according to the Hebrew text. But according to the Septuagint, he was four cubits and one span. And uh, I got that information from gotquestions.org. Now this is roughly six foot six inches. Interestingly, the tallest man in the world is Sultan Kosen from Turkey, who stands at eight feet two inches. The tallest man who ever lived was Robert Wadlow, an American who stood at 8 feet 11 inches. It seems highly unlikely that anyone has ever been much taller, especially since we have no evidence for Goliath outside of the Bible. Anne Barker, writing for abc.net.au, states, 
Short of finding his bronze armour or a skull with a pebble-sized hole, historians may never prove that Goliath existed. There is little to no evidence that Goliath ever existed and precious little evidence that David existed. Now, back to bad-tempered Badger. Dangerous creature number two, Behemoth. Now I live in England, I'm English, and this nation used to once be a great nation which loved the Lord Jesus Christ. Not everyone was a Christian, but there was a lot of people who respected God. We sent out missionaries to some of your countries, Nigeria. We sent out missionaries to, to America, to all around the world. Well, that's not colonialist at all, is it? It wasn't a case of people going to other cultures and wiping out their local traditions in the name of Jesus. Nope, not at all. This was a good thing, guys. But now, very few people respect God, and many people would identify as atheists. Hello! And as a street preacher, do you know what one of the number one questions I get asked? Well, let me just show you right now. Yeah, 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 I was about to say that. What about your dinosaurs, man? Pardon? What about your dinosaurs? Yeah, good question. That's this. And many atheists come to me, and if you're an atheist, you ask me this question all the time. Where do dinosaurs come from? If you read the Bible, there are dinosaurs in the Bible. Now, to my Christian friends listening right now, have you ever been asked that question before? Well, if you ever get asked, are dinosaurs in the Bible, just point them to Job chapter 40. It says this, See now, his strength is in his hips, and his power is in his stomach. He moves his tail like a cedar. Indeed, the river may rage, yet he is not disturbed. So dinosaurs are really in the Bible. I don't know, chap. That sounds like it could just as well be a hippo to me. In fact, my Bible has a picture of a hippo next to this passage. So dinosaurs are really in the Bible. Why? Because the Bible is true. And the book of Job is believed to be the oldest book ever written in the Bible. So it's very possible, it's, in fact it's very likely, that dinosaurs were still roaming the earth when the book of Job was written. Is it though? If you mean birds, which are part of the dinosaur clade, then I suppose you're right. You don't mean that though, do you? You mean the big lizard-like creatures which went extinct around 66 million years ago. Scholars apparently agree it was written between the 7th and 4th centuries BC, so about 66 million years after the dinosaurs went extinct. And this dinosaur with a tail like a cedar tree, like a tree trunk, is probably a Diplodocus. It's actually pronounced Diplodocus. I know, I was disappointed as well. Does the description in the Bible fit one of those though. Let's have a look. Eats grass like a cow. Oh, well that fell at the first hurdle, didn't it? It's debatable if grass as we currently think of it had even evolved yet when Diplodocus was around, and its neck was better suited to grazing conifers and ferns. The rest of this description could just as easily fit a hippo, bison, rhino, moose, or any other large animal living near water. While we're here, let's just look at that timeline again to drive the point home. Diplodocus, way back here. Book of Job, over here. They're nowhere near each other. But it is important to remember this. God doesn't describe this dinosaur so that skeptics think, oh right, okay, the Bible's true because dinosaurs were around at the same time in the ancient world. No, God describes Behemoth really for one reason. To humble you and I. You and I have something in common. We both came from dust. We're nothing but dust and ashes. And the God who made these great big beasts, Behemoth, and in a moment's time we're going to think about another one, is saying, look, you're weak. And although we are nothing, this great big God loves us deeply. But he does demand that we respect him, that we repent, turn of our sins, put our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, and live every single breath for him, because he's worthy of our praise and our worship. And thirdly and finally, one of the most terrifying creatures described in the Bible is Leviathan. From the beginning of the world, men and women have been fascinated with sea monsters. We hear about mermaids, we hear about Moby Dick. In the Pirates of the Caribbean we heard about the Kraken, Jaws, 
And not too far from where I live, uh, there's a place called Loch Ness. Have you heard of Nessie, the Loch Ness Monster? But if we put all of those sea monsters together, none of them are more terrifying than the description of Leviathan. God says this, Can you draw out Leviathan with a hook, or snare his tongue with a line which you lower? Who can open the doors of his face with his terrible teeth all around? On earth there is nothing like him which is made without fear. Hmm, yes, that sounds a bit dinosaur-y, doesn't it? Let's read the rest of the passage. His breath starts fires burning. Flames leap out of his mouth. His neck is so powerful that all who meet him are terrified. There is not a weak spot in his skin. It is as hard and unyielding as iron. His stony heart is without fear, as unyielding and hard as a millstone. When he rises up, even the strongest are frightened. They are helpless with fear. There is no sword that can wound him, no spear or arrow or lance that can harm him. For him, iron is as flimsy as straw and bronze as soft as rotten wood. There is no arrow that can make him run. Rocks thrown at him are like bits of straw. To him, a club is a piece of straw. And he laughs when men throw spears. The scales on his belly are like jagged pieces of pottery. They tear up the muddy ground like a threshing sledge. He churns up the sea like boiling water and makes it bubble like a pot of oil. He leaves a shining path behind him and turns the sea to white foam. There is nothing on earth to compare with him. He is a creature that has no fear. He looks down on even the proudest animals. He is the king of all wild beasts. So, uh, yeah, this is Smaug. Hashtag Biblical Smaug. You can't just pick and choose from a description of a literal fire-breathing dragon and pretend it proves that the entire fossil record is wrong, chap. Back to you, Mr. Sofa. One day, God is going to destroy everything that is evil. Come on, Kirby. You haven't even proved to us that God exists. How do you expect us to believe that he's going to destroy anything, let alone everything that is evil? And my question to you is, whose side are you on? Will you be caught up with all the things that are evil, with Leviathan and all the wicked things on that day of wrath? Or are you protected by the Son of God's precious blood? Protected by the Son of God's blood? Ugh, that's a bit gross, Curb. Who died 2,000 years ago for sinners. If you have not yet come to the Lord Jesus Christ, don't resist him a day longer. He loves you, he rose from the dead, and he says any sinner, anyone who will humble themselves and realize that they need me, the savior of the world, if they put their trust in me, if they turn from their wicked ways and give their life to me, I will forgive them and give them eternal life. It is highly unlikely that the Christ of the Bible even existed, and even less likely that he rose from the dead and lives today for me to believe and put my trust in him. So I think I'll pass. Will you do it? Will you come to the Lord Jesus Christ? Just before you go, can I be a little bit transparent with you? I really have struggled to make this video today. In myself, I like to go to the easier texts. I'm not a very deep guy, and very often I'm quite comfortable just paddling around in the shallows. But the Christian faith does demand that we do go deeper, and we do wrestle with passages that we don't understand. Well, here's a passage for you to wrestle with. Hosea 13, 16. The people of Samaria must bear their guilt because they rebelled against their God. They will fall by the sword. Their little ones will be dashed to the ground. Their pregnant women ripped open. Perhaps you can answer the following. One. Why would God do
do such a thing? Two, how was this passage understood by the original readers? And three, what are the practical applications for us today? I look forward to your answers. Well, that's all I've got to say. Well, I just want to close by thanking my good friend, Bad Tempered Badger, for helping me out with this video. And there's a link to his channel in the description. And uh, so do go and subscribe if you haven't already. And if you've liked this video and you'd like to see more, then do subscribe to my channel and press the bell icon so that you never miss another video. Bye for now.